you know, this, this one, I want to tie this, what you're explaining that this is the time of endings. Um, I know that you uh, and I in previous interviews and also in our interview with Barbara, uh, we talk about denial, you know, that we are, you know, we, we frame that specifically within this discussion around climate disruption and the ecological crisis um, that we are witnessing uh, really unprecedented change that, you know, there's maybe a few things that could be done to maybe mitigate some of the worst impacts of it. But I mean, we're way past the point of return on this when it comes to the climate crisis in particular. And how we all, when we come to that information in our own way, in our own lives, we have to uh, confront our own denial. Uh, and it comes in waves. It doesn't, it doesn't, it's not like you just come to this place of complete acceptance and you just, you know, all right, I'm good. It's something that comes in waves. And I, I've seen in myself, not only with the climate crisis and seeing how it's unfolding just in the past few months, even, um, but also with these social crises and these public health crises that we're in the midst of in the United States specifically and globally. Uh, but seeing all these crises play out, it's just like, is this really happening? And there is this part of me that's very real that I have to that I have to speak with. You know, I, I, I'm learning to speak to these different parts of myself and accept them for what they are. Um, but this part of me that's like, I really just wanted to go back to the way it was, <laughs> whatever that was, even if it was shit, I, I wish it wasn't like this. And I know a deeper part of me knows that that's not ever going to come back. We're never going to have that. And if you frame this pandemic and these social crises within the broader crisis of the climate crisis and the ecological crisis, this is just a dress rehearsal. This is just getting us ready I mean, if you could say that, getting us ready for even deeper, more disruptive events that are on the horizon, and we can see them playing out right now. Um, and so I guess to speak to this thing where I think a lot of people that are in our, I guess, our field of discussion, um, our, I guess, our circles where we're talking about denial and accepting climate disruption, I think even these people that are wanting to have those discussions about climate disruption are having a hard time even accepting what's happening right in front of their face, very, very close to them, which is happening on a social, cultural level um, and in a public health level as well. I'm just curious if you see if you see those parallels there of the denial of what's happening. Um, you know, people are seeing people get shot at these protests. They're seeing a lot of disruption happening right now. They're seeing a president like you pointed to that's just blatantly dog whistling to white supremacists in this country right now people think that an election and getting him out of office is going to bring us back to some sense of normalcy and to me that just reeks of denialism uh so i, I guess to ask and frame that for you which is what parallels do you see in the discussions around uh climate disruption and acceptance of that reality and an acceptance of the reality of where we are socially and culturally right now Right, right. Yeah, you made, I mean, really several really good points and articulated a lot of it really well. And, and I, I you know, first I want to, I, I, for a long time, I've been really critical of how, how much denial there is in this country, uh, and not just on the right regarding the climate crisis and other crises and racism and xenophobia and sexism and, you know, all these things sure. that it's so blatantly obvious that the right does. But but even on the left, you know, things like the Green New Deal and, you know, there's this softer denialism on the left with these crises. And I think that includes even how we look at this upcoming so-called election, you know, like that people still behaving as though. Uh, that's going to be some kind of agent and change this this far along and in, in the death of the empire. So, um, but regarding the climate crisis, I'm in in all of this is is I think it's it's very very important again that we talk about the right way to do endings, and I, I understand that denial of you know it no matter how hardened we've become, you know, none of us as a human being psychologically can sit there and just stare at the unraveling and the fire every day. I mean, it would be our psychological undoing. It would be the unraveling of our, our mental health. You know, this is what you know, I, I've struggled with depression a, a lot, but just because of what I've stared at in my work, it's another part of why I've stepped out of journalism uh, for my own spiritual well-being. But but 
so I, I have a certain amount of empathy for people who uh, don't want to really look at how far along we are regarding the climate crisis and uh, the fact that we are living in a fascistic country at this point. And it's it's because it's terrifying to look at and it's terrifying to think about the implications. And, and it, it scares me. I mean, I, I look out at what's happening and what's coming and what I saw in Iraq and seeing, you know, these parallels happening here. Um, you know, I and, and, and understanding that when things start to unravel at a point here, we have, you know, organized militia attacks in different cities on a broader scale uh, happening, you know, probably in the coming months and a lot more death and a lot more insecurity and a lot more chaos. Like who wants to live in a world like that? I mean, that's very, very frightening. So. I, I have empathy for people that don't really want to see that. And, and I think it's easier for me to see because I've 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 worked a, a substantial part of my life in, in war zones, not just in Iraq, and see what happens when societies unravel and that um, there's the vast majority of the people uh, are they're They're very humanitarian and and look out for each other and care for each other. And you see I've seen some of the most beautiful, selfless acts of humanity in those situations. And I've also seen utter barbarism where there's a, a, a smaller minority group that will take advantage of the situation and and kill and loot and and, and basically turn uh, really, really barbaric. And we're, we're seeing that here, too, you mm -hmm. know, which mm -hmm. we've already talked about. But I think, you know, the, the thing that I really am just when I look out and I'm, I'm so baffled it how still people won't really understand um, uh, how far along we are politically in this country, as well as how far along we are in the climate crisis. So that that people can look at the amount of disinformation is so intense and denialism that people can't see the fact that right now in Siberia, 2.85 million acres of forest and tundra have burned in wildfires. It's climate disruption fueled wildfires. And the amount of CO2 being released as we speak from that permafrost is so great that, you know, by the end of this year, going into next year, we could see, you know, a quarter to a half a, a centigrade increase in, in global temperature just just in this one year, and this is despite the lower CO2 emissions that happen uh, from the, the economic shutdown globally, temp at least temporarily, from the pandemic crisis. So, so what that's going to mean climatologically, and people will be surprised, even though we're seeing this happen right now in front of our face, or that people are going to be surprised somehow in November when we don't have a legitimate election or don't have one at all, uh, even despite seeing all the writing on the wall and all the moves being made by this administration and the Justice Department right now, that somehow people are going to be surprised. And I think that's that's really a direct result of how this is a culture that that won't and can't do endings. And that when when you and Barbara and I uh, had that conversation last summer for your podcast and we talked about that, how how this is a culture of the denial of death that. Is that we're, we are in the death process of whatever semblance of democracy that may have ever existed in this country is 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 gone now. We are we have we are in an ending and a death process of huge swaths of the planet. I mean, like, let me let me put it this way to make it more personal that I have two aging parents, uh, both with pretty intense pre-existing health conditions who live down in Houston and I'm up in the Pacific Northwest. Uh, they, you know, Houston right now, as we speak, is one of the epicenters of the virus. It's just exploding thanks to a right wing governor who mm. insisted on opening everything up despite being in a global pandemic. My parents, they're too afraid to travel. They're they're stuck there. Uh, my sister and brother and I have all t taken efforts to try to Im impel them and urge them to leave. And, and, you know, they could they could come up here or they could go stay at my sister's in the northeast where she lives on a small farm and be a lot safer, at least, and have a good chance of making it through this without 
catching this dreaded uh, disease. And they've been they're too afraid to leave. And so I've had to accept that um, I got to see them in March, in early March, and that that might well be the last time that I get to see my aging parents, because if they end up getting this disease, of course, I understand that it would be foolhardy of me to fly during a global pandemic because then I might get it. And if they didn't go into a hospital, I wouldn't be allowed in to see them anyway. So it's it's quite likely it's quite likely that I have seen my parents alive for the last time. And now how many other people in this country are having that experience? If you really think about it, it's probably millions of people and I have to accept that. Right. So that's yeah. a very personal acceptance that I have to make. And I, I've had to get there just in the last week. This all this all came to the fore over the last week for me. And it's that same process now with the country, with the planet, with the climate. Like, look, I'm never going to see a polar bear because I've never seen one. I'm not going to be able to travel for a long time, nor do I even want to. And, and, you know, if in 10 years or 15 years from now that changes, they may well already be gone by then anyway. And how many other people are going to have to say that right now or say that about ever getting to see the Great Barrier Reef? I mean, go down the list, Patrick. Mm. How many things right now do we have to let go of because we're in a time of endings? And that, that also means we, this calls on us to be so present in our own personal process and this is why I've not been writing because I don't even know what to write because this it's like sitting in hospice or sitting at the bedside of someone that you love as they die that my full focus on now is just being very, very present with my own personal experience of what's going on and then understanding what's really, really important. And then how can I still find ways to serve during this time? And for me, what that has boiled down to is I have a small community of people that are living on or tied directly to this little piece of land where I and a few other people live uh, up here on the Olympic Peninsula. We're growing food, we take care of each other, we talk together about what's happening on the planet and in this in this country right now. And I my job that I I what's been made very clear to me is it's not to go try to stop an occupation of another country. It's not to try to stop the climate crisis. It's how can I serve my immediate community? Because that's one thing that I can do right now. And I feel like in a crisis situation, in a survival situation, which we are in now, and it's grossly obvious to me that we are all in that. Then each one of us has to, I think, get really quiet and figure out how can I really serve now? Because we are morally obliged to keep serving. And I think really, realistically, uh, it, it's going to be starting with at least uh, how do I take care of my 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 immediate community where I live?